Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation, the podcast that explores the reality of a word in danger of losing its meaning altogether. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Katrine Zimmerman on the show today. She is the managing director of TLGG, where she advises C-suite clients on innovation, business strategy, and digital and marketing transformations. Prior to TLGG, Katrine co-created the Lufthansa Innovation Hub, where she developed ventures in the services and mobility fields. Katrine, thank you so much for joining us today. I am so excited for this conversation, and I'm sure it's going to be a great one. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Jared. Well, let's dive right in then, shall we? Yeah. What, to your mind, is innovation? Um, Innovation to me is a practice where you bring new things to life. And I would emphasize the new things and ideally the aspect of new things that add value to life. Mm. So that to me is what innovation entails. And that can be product, services, could potentially even be processes that come to life in a new manner. Mm. Bringing new things to life. I like that. When you talk about new, what does new mean to you? I think we differentiate particularly in the aspect or the lens that I take in my day-to-day job, which has a lot of things with digital. Mm -hmm. So we differentiate in the classical horizon logic of something that's incremental innovation that adds on to something that's existing already in the world. It could be a product, it could be a service, something that is more adjacent to the existing and something that is more transformational. So creating something entirely new. Mm -hmm. And that would be often falling into what you will hear in mainstream media as disruptive innovation, for example. Right. And so innovation is a bit of a terminology that stretches across the three. And hence, that can create a lot of, or some maybe, some confusion every once in a while to what is innovation and what is no innovation. Right. It definitely can and has. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. I think it's an important distinction to say it's just about bringing new things to life versus completely transforming a category. Mm -hmm. The incremental innovation is innovation because it brings a new thing to life. And I think that's an important clarification in your definition. I'm glad you kind of brought that up. It makes me wonder, as you then think about the other piece that you added, which is about value, Mm -hmm. incremental innovations and so-called disruptive innovations look very different from a value perspective Mm -hmm. and an ROI perspective. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's studies done on the impact. So when we, and I work in a consultancy that helps companies bring innovation to life, maybe that for context. When we talk about innovation with our clients across these three horizons, from incremental to adjacent to transformative, we oftentimes say that from an investment perspective in the short term, you bring the most to the incremental and adjacent and the least to the transformational. But from a long-term ROI perspective, and by long-term I speak 10-year horizon, the transformational component should be having the highest impact on your portfolio. Mm. So depending on, and this is obviously 10,000 meters high, looking at a corporation on where and how to do their investment strategy for innovation, that is how we would recommend to look at innovation portfolio from an investment versus ROI perspective. Mm, That makes a lot of sense. And that portfolio-driven approach, I think, is absolutely critical to sustaining investment in innovation Mm -hmm. because... If you only focus on the near-term stuff, you're only going to get small returns that over time may not feel like they're worth the investment, or you're going to run out of energy and patience for the long-term stuff, and then you get no return on your investment, and then that doesn't feel like it's worth it. So the portfolio approach you're describing, I think, is critical to making it through that 10-year horizon. You can't just fill your portfolio with disruptive moonshot kind of innovations and think you're going to be able to sustain Beyond the investment, but the energy investment of your team and the organization. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And I think it's quite interesting that if I look at the past 10 years in innovation, innovation cycle was heavily induced by our ability to use digital technology to improve or bring innovation to the table much faster. And now since last year, more in the commoditized, everyone knows about it. But in the vein of the next wave of technology-induced innovation, we are now in the cycle of AI. And AI in the hype cycle of everyone has heard about it, at least. Yes. Maybe not applied it yet. 
And so to me, it's an interesting learning, obviously, taking my experience from the past 10 years where we kind of looked at digitalization and digital transformation more as the components of innovation in the digital age, now moving into the AI age. And what does that mean for innovation and how do we drive that? What will be the changing components in how we innovate as a practice slash methodology? Mm. So it's quite an interesting time, I think, for the innovation field to look into its reinvention. Maybe reinvention is a strong word. Look into its evolution in the context of AI. Ah, yes. I think evolution is the perfect word, especially in the context you're talking about AI. I've had a lot of conversations about AI, as you have as well, I'm sure. One thing that strikes me is that there aren't a lot of people talking about how it fits in the history of technological advances of humanity. Mm -hmm. And we've made giant leaps in the past. If you think about the first powered flight was in 1903, December of 1903, and we landed on the moon in 1969. Mm -hmm. That's insane. We went from no powered flight to landing 240,000 miles away on the surface of the moon in less than 70 years. Mm -hmm. And so we've made huge leaps before. I'm curious, what do you think makes this such a different thing for, for people to wrap their minds around? It feels like there's more resistance, more fear mm -hmm. beyond just it being the next step in the technology, like the chatbots and the different things we've been using for ages. Mm -hmm. It just got better really fast and it seems like it has sparked a different kind of reaction. I would say, I mean, first, first point, maybe it feels like it's in a similar timeline as the timeline you've just been talking about, right? The early days of discussions of, okay, let's create an artificial intelligence dates back to pre-Second World War times, right? Wow. So there is an ongoing quest of humans right. um, to create something similar, maybe, to what we can do. And in the end, when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's really about the things, the cognitive abilities that we as humans have and replicating them. Mm. And to me, it's fascinating in the sense of why it creates fear is obviously because we have been the dominant species, right? Mm. We've always talked about it. And in the same vein, you will see that in the news, an increase on talking about aliens and UFOs. Because it is this question of, is there something out there, whether that's artificial intelligence or another species, potentially, Interesting. that kind of comes up with the subject of artificial intelligence to me which is, in my opinion, also the reason that it creates more fear. Because for the first time, we're talking about creating something that can do what we do, and we've been the prime in food chain, right? Mm. So what does that mean? And are we hands on that's a very philosophical question almost. Mm -hmm. Are we potentially at the risk of extinction of ourselves by continuing this kind of research? Mm. I see. It's a little bit... A question for, I think it has a religious perspective on can we or should we pretend to be something godlike that creates something similar to us? Mm. That's a religious question. So that's why people are afraid or wonder. Mm -hmm. There's a philosophical question, there's a political question, there's a financial question. And so it's a bit of a game changer or step level change, which is why it creates, in my opinion, fear rather than positive anticipation. Then on the other hand side, when we invented the car, right, Americans have quite some history in that <laughs> there was a similar chaos and similar fear at the beginning, right? There were no traffic lights, uh, there was no stop signage, like there was a lot of chaos. Right. There's always chaos when something of this magnitude comes to society and step by step we're then following suit on what is the best way and how to adopt it. That's legislation, that's public opinion, that's trends of utilization, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, mm, I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's, it's kind of the threat to humanity that creates the fear. My anticipation. You know, it makes perfect sense because when you think about the car, the introduction of it put saddle makers out of business, put horse breeders, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff went away and it transformed the transportation industry but I don't think people were afraid of a car mm -hmm. in the same way that people are afraid of AI. The only other analogy I can think of is Enrico Fermi's work with nuclear power, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nuclear reactions. 
because at the moment you realize, oh, this can create a lot of energy and solve a lot of problems for humanity. Mm -hmm. You realize, oh, this could create a lot of energy that could cause a lot of problems for humanity. Mm -hmm. And that, again, is in that same time frame you were talking about, late 30s, 40s. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of historical perspective that could be useful in thinking about innovation and giving us some perspective to be able to pivot more people to thinking about it as a tool mm -hmm. and as an advancement and as something to be harnessed versus something to fear and to see it as innovation, something that can add value to your definition. No, absolutely. But as with nuclear power, I love this example. The Center of Humane Technology also uses this example in the context of what is AI and why are we afraid of it? Um, we have significant regulation and we are all aware that if we would start another war that leverages nuclear power, that has significant implications on how we live today. Mm -hmm. right. And while we potentially manned up, there's also now a time to man down on this level of innovation because we understand the implications. And I think that influences the discussion around AI also. And it's fueled by the fact that we have AI experts on both sides of the spectrum telling us this is the one extreme, this is the other extreme, right? Yes. And so I think that is a component that will be challenging to overcome. I think a good other example of innovation that has actually landed in a similar implication as nuclear power is GMO. Mm. Because when it was brought to the marketplace, it got so much negative connotation so quickly that yes. GMO is, is a bad word these days. Whether that is true for all components where GMO might be used is a different question. So innovation, and to come back to, to the theme, mm -hmm. is obviously also then bringing something to life successfully that has a positive connotation in the value creation part. Yeah, maybe that is the add-on. Yeah, <laughs> No, I think it's implied in the definition of value. So you're left to define your own, create your own definition of value. And I think, mm -hmm. and most people's definition of value, something's not valuable if it doesn't do something positive. So I think it's built right into your definition as is. Good. <laughs> as we kind of circle back to innovation in particular, I think we've touched on a few different examples of innovation over the years, aviation, nuclear power. We talked about space race, all those things. They either created or exist in very distinct industries. Mm -hmm. I think you and I have similar experience of kind of working across industries and across domains mm -hmm. from a functional perspective. Yeah. What can you share about the role of defining innovation for cross-functional teams and environments like that? I love where you're going because I think that's super important. So I originally, my first career was in the airline industry. And here we always talk about innovation cycles of 8 to 15 years, because that is roughly the product life cycle of an aircraft. Ah. And so within that, that's a defining frame for, at least when it comes to product innovation, um, that sits on the hardware side. So innovation cycles on the hardware side are relevant. Innovation cycles on the software side oftentimes are much faster. Mm -hmm. So these industries that have based on long cycle product innovations have probably the higher challenges in short term um, software, for example, innovation or software related innovation cycles. I see. And so we see when we talk about industries and what's my learning that the longer the product cycle innovation timeline is, the more struggle it is for an industry to adopt these high speed technologically induced innovation cycles. Mm. right because mm -hmm. the organization of setup is different and the cultural setup of an organization is different and so we see in these big industries that today are facing some of the amazing opportunities that technology provides to experiment with and create innovation from they really struggle in bringing that into their organization from an inside out perspective mm. that is the automotive industry that is healthcare obviously Pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals, highly regulated. That is the airline industry also because of the product life cycles. Mm. Um, that is also the, the oil industry because when you build an oil plant, yes, all of that takes time. So depending on the speed of product innovation, that is the difference. 
you have worked in CPG, I've worked in CPG, totally different innovation cycles, mm -hmm. like much faster, potentially heavy on the incremental part mm -hmm. because you can continuously spin it out. I'm very different to where I traditionally come from in the airline industry. Yeah, very different. <laughs> Night and day. Yes, I think that's such an important insight that what function defines the innovation cycle in a cross-functional large organization. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the product cycle dominates in more capital-heavy and investment-driven mm -hmm. environments where you have to spend a lot of money to create your product and to distribute your product mm -hmm. and create a lot of fixed equipment and fixed things. Mm -hmm. And then if I think about the modern companies that are the Netflix, Facebook, Meta, they don't have the capital investments to change and evolve their products are relatively small. Mm -hmm. And so their product cycle is closer to the pace of the digital and other types of innovation cycles. Because I think the other thing you highlight here is that there are different innovation cycles in a company, mm -hmm. which I don't think everybody kind of has a full understanding of. If you haven't worked inside of one of these complex bureaucratic organizations, I think we were talking earlier, <laughs> my, my job once was to create an innovation process inside of an innovation process in a company. Mm -hmm. So these different cycles, one of them has to dominate and set the tone and the pace for the overall organization. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an important point. Yeah, it has to. And sometimes it doesn't have to. I think that's a little bit the aspect, right? Mm. Like, let's use the automotive industry to me as an example. There's an innovation component that's attached to the product being in this case a vehicle, and in that as a form factor. So how am I changing the hardware? How am I changing the hardware as it becomes smart? How do I connect it? All of that is innovation in itself around the product, and that is key. But then tying that to the platform that a new vehicle creates that potentially is smart and connected in the context of the Internet of Things. Right. And then what is the innovation cycle that sits on top of that? Right. What are the products and services that I might innovate that sit on top of that? And how do I create an innovation process that might be very different for all of these digital connected services mm. that we call ARCAS in the automotive industry versus the product in itself, which is the car? Sure. Can I do that within the same organization? Do I need two different organizations? How do I connect that? How does it feel connected from a consumer perspective? Because in the end, I'm buying a car that's connected that has an interface, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of challenges in an innovation field to come across. And what I'm realizing, the more, the more siloed in retrospective we've been doing innovation in certain industry, the less sustainable they are in the long run. Yes, well said. Um, so it's very difficult to balance the aspect, particularly when you talk about innovation in a big company, when and how do I do it very far away from the core organization in order to be fast and to learn and to drive the organization to be faster, potentially? And when do I integrate it into the older infrastructures, the more traditional logics? And how do I balance that in the best way to have the most impactful outcome? Mm -hmm. um, I think the last 10 years on digital transformation have brought a lot of learning in that context that we can use now for innovation moving forward. That makes a lot of sense. I think, like you said, as you talk about moving forward and what we can learn and, and take away from that, a couple of things come to mind. One is this concept of innovation hubs and how those plug into companies internally, like an internal innovation hub, and externally, like an innovation hub that is not affiliated within an organization. Yeah. The other thing that comes to mind is how ingrained product cycles are in our minds. Because when you mention the automotive industry, when you go online to buy a car, the first thing they ask is what year car are you looking for? That is the first filter for the cycle of the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. I want a Mustang. What year Mustang do you want? Model year is important. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so that sets, that sets what you're talking about. I hadn't even kind of mentally recognized that within that industry, but I would imagine that everything upstream of that or back further into the organization from there is tuned to, okay, well, what's going to go into the 2025 Mustang? What's going to go into the 2026 Bronco? What's going to go into the 2027 Porsche Cayenne? Whatever. Yeah. 
And so to me, that's more of a product cycle than a technology cycle. Mm -hmm. And it's more consumer and Wall Street driven than technology driven, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't think new things are being invented every year. If I think about some of the things in the CPG world, we wanted new news on a product. It wasn't always, let's go invent something so we have new news. It was, mm -hmm. let's change the color of this or let's redesign that because we need something to talk about in this window. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's the chicken or the egg is kind of what I'm trying to get at around technology and consumer expectations and Wall Street expectations. Does that make sense? No, it does. I think the interesting part, though, is that on the hardware side, in the past, I could develop, put it into the market, and then I could be innovative around communicating it, upgrading it, enhancing it, right? Yes. Yeah. With a connected product, let's use the car again because we've been going with it, I can continuously update the product as well because that's what Tesla does over the air update. Right. It's a huge cost aspect, but it's also a huge communication aspect, right? The dark OTA update, like the different fun aspect that suddenly <laughs> right. brings to you. And that is just still innovation cycle on the product because the product is now connected. But that's new. Yeah. That's new to the automotive industry. Totally. Yeah. Totally. That's what I'm saying is that it's not an industry that is predicated or used to being oh, no. able to deliver new consumer benefits. Oh, absolutely. Outside of the auto show and the this and the that and all those other things like on a Tuesday, you could create a whole new user experience for people in their car. And that is, that's new. But as you were correctly stating, only for the model year, which is why they asked the first question of what the model year are you looking for? <laughs> exactly. But you as a consumer have absolutely no insight if model year 23 versus model year 24 has any difference and what it might mean on the long tail since I'm ordering a car that I might own for three up to 10 years at this point, right? Right. And so the interesting thing, and I think that's why we're still in the innovation cycle for products like cars or connected cars today, is because we're coming oftentimes from a legacy thinking of, I'm producing model year this, and that is going to be the key denomination for my product. Right. But from a consumer perspective, you're like, I don't care what the model year is. Yeah. I care what the product can do for me. And that shift has not yet fully transpired in the industry which is what you were so nicely referring to, right? Mm -hmm. And so continuously, we are on the innovation path in these industries as they see significant technology-induced shifts in this case right. that need capturing and that can only be captured over time. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. It's interesting, the hardware investment, the relative hardware investment across industries. Mm -hmm. Let's say a car is $50,000, a phone is Fifteen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Laptop is a thousand dollars. You know what I mean? Yeah. These different things and the life cycles and the way they've been defined along those terms. With a phone, you buy a phone. You expect it to be something when you buy it, when you get it. Mm -hmm. But you expect it to be something different six months later because you expect updates, you expect refreshes, you expect those other things. Mm -hmm. But to your point, if I bought a car five years ago, I bought it with no expectation that it would have new features five years from now, because how could it? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's a really interesting new world that we've entered. I hadn't really considered that. Yeah, it's exciting. And it's just the, the biggest thing in our day-to-day -day life that is being transformed right now. We will see the next generation of heart monitors. We will speak about model years because they will be connected as well. Mm. And do they only give information to your HCP or is there a direct to consumer interface for my heart monitor or for what other else I might be putting into my body or around my body to measure all my vitals, right? Right. All of these things are coming to life now mm. and we'll be seeing a lot of innovation and thinking through what are the right customer experiences and ways of solving problems for human beings. Sure, sure. How do you help other people think about these complex things? I mean, this has been helpful. This conversation has been helpful to me to think about the automotive industry differently. How do you go about helping organizations and teams and people think differently about innovation? It really depends on the industry and some of the context you're in. Mm -hmm. So what I think makes us different is that we don't have a one-size-fits-all approach. It goes very much into looking at 
what's the industry that I'm in? What's the particular company that I'm in? What's the setup of the company? What's the general cultural sentiment towards innovation? How is it being used today? Mm -hmm. And then customizing a little bit of an approach. There's almost, I wouldn't say that we have it, but there's a joint understanding amongst our team of a certain maturity model of innovation deployment across. And then depending on where one stands, we pull out different solutions, ideas, or develop completely new approaches for a particular organization. Mm -hmm. As with anything in the world, a wave of, okay, everyone has an innovation hub. Everyone has a corporate venture fund. Everyone does this. Right. And then five to six years in, everyone realizes, oh, we should, I mean, a famous Columbia professor calls it the innovation theater. Yeah. Everyone ran because it was creating some nice PR for the time being. And then most people realized the ROI was very limited. Or they were not clear on, do I have a financial ROI target? How do I implement it? Is it only an HR aspect for me to get the latest talent? Is it a marketing activity? So how do I balance these things and what does it do for me? I think that was a good learning of the past 10 years. And how do we now iterate that as we move into the next wave of innovation that might be more sustainable, hopefully? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I think that 10 years ago, the definition of innovation broader definition of innovation didn't have the value component that you've incorporated into it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't emphasized. It wasn't emphasized. Yeah. And so people didn't expect it and people didn't plan for it. Yeah. When you don't integrate it into your scorecard for innovation, it leaves you to put the potential for being disappointed. Oh, totally. But I think also we are now conscious because money is more expensive now, right? Yeah. Oh, certainly. <laughs> certainly. <laughs> so, yes. No, but it, that does something to innovation. It does. And, and I think we have to be quite conscious of it, right? When money is cheap, it doesn't cost as much. When money is expensive to experiment, when money is expensive, there's much less experimentation will and much higher expectation on, okay, what's my ROI? And so I think that is a whole game that we're now in. And I think that's going to proceed for the time being that innovation as a practice has to consider because the games of pure play experimentation or the times of pure play experimentation are not really as nice as they were maybe <laughs> five years ago. So we will see a different expectation towards innovation moving forward or the innovation practice moving forward. Yes, it makes sense. And it, it's back to your portfolio approach across incremental to disruptive. Mm -hmm. The different economic cycles require a different portfolio adjustment, just like in the financial world. Mm -hmm. Your portfolio should probably be more weighted toward incremental and other near term ROI things right now. That doesn't mean you don't do the other stuff. It just means you shift your allocations to reflect the realities that you're working in. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's a great point. This has been an amazing conversation, Katrine, and I can't let you go without asking you for some advice for innovators. Do you have any advice that you would offer to innovators out there? I have some advice. It's not mine, but the advice I was given when I embarked on the journey is you can always apologize later. So getting things started in the field of innovation is the core because it's all about, and I think in the startup world, you often hear the idea is worth nothing. The execution is worth everything. And so in innovation, execution is key. And as long as you can get to that, it's not really innovation. And so get going, break things. I know that's a thing that many people say, but it's really about you can apologize later. It's really getting started. That's what's to me core in the innovation practice. Mm, that's great advice. You can always apologize later. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Katrine Zimmerman, innovation is bringing new things to life that add value. Thank you so much for your time. Is there a way people can learn more from you, hear from you in other places? Yes. Yeah, so the easiest right now is probably via LinkedIn. Um, as X is um, evolving into a new place as well. I think that's a more limited space. And these days, LinkedIn is probably the easiest. And I'm always eager to connect, have a coffee around the subject, because I think it's so fascinating um, how we are creating new things in the world. So please reach out anytime. Oh, thank you so much for your time and I look forward to staying in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Take care. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to get more insights from innovators across the world. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional content and conversation. I hope to see you there. Until next time, keep
keep innovating, whatever that means.